So some of the Victorian holiday traditions and how they've sort of emerged into a lot of the traditions that people still use today, uh, some of the backstories on where these things came from and how they've emerged over time and how they've changed um, throughout the course of our history. So I'm going to give you a very brief piece on Thanksgiving because a lot of our um, traditions surrounding Thanksgiving also come from this time period. Um, and then we'll go right into the Christmas traditions. Um, that'll be the bulk of, of the presentation. All right. So, okay, so we'll begin with Thanksgiving. Um, the very first Thanksgiving was actually celebrated on October 3rd of 1789 um, when, uh, when President um, George Washington proclaimed that we would have a day of Thanksgiving. It was not a national holiday like we celebrate today. Uh, it was just one day end of Revolutionary War, we should be thankful for everything that we have at that moment. Um, it wasn't until 1863, um, 1863, when it was finally proclaimed a national holiday by President Abraham Lincoln. Um, it was declared to be celebrated on the last Thursday in November, wherever that may fall. Um, in 1864, they celebrated um, the very first where the government was providing food, um, they provided to the um, Union troops during the war at Grant's headquarters in Virginia. Um, they had served them things like canned peaches, apples, cakes, of course, turkey, and 400,000 pounds of ham, which is an awful lot of ham for anyone to, to have. Um, by 1939, Franklin Roosevelt unofficially moved the holiday to the fourth Thursday in November, just in case we should happen to have a November where there's a fifth Thursday thrown in there, the way that the, the weeks should fall. Um, he did this in 1939 as we were coming out of the Great Depression uh, in order to lengthen the shopping season for the Christmas holiday. Because of course, as most people know, the day after Thanksgiving, we now refer to as Black Friday, but it was always a day to begin your holiday celebrations and your shopping. So it was a good way to spur the economy as we were coming out of the Great Depression. And in 1941, they officially passed the legislation to have it take place on the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, one of the things to come out of um, the Victorian era um, is a lot of music. Um, you'll see as I go through the Christmas piece a little bit further in that during the Victorian era, printing became wi more widely available. Um, paper became a lot cheaper. Mass production becomes more possible as well. So a lot of music starts to get written and published for the first time to get out to the mass market and into everybody's hands. Thanksgiving is no different. Um, most people don't think of music as being associated with the Thanksgiving holiday. But in 1844, Lydia Maria Child wrote the poem Over the River and Through the Woods uh, that was then put to music. It was written to be a Thanksgiving song. Um, the other name for the song is the New England Boys Song at Thanksgiving. And you can see here a sketch um, that goes along with the song from when it was published. It has since become more of a Christmas song because of its references to the winter and the snow that we more associate with that December time frame, as opposed to November. Um, also during the Victorian era is when we get this idea of what the Thanksgiving should look like. Um, people start to depict family gatherings, particularly a Thanksgiving meal in the home. 
Um, so this is where we start to get the ideas of what type of foods we should be eating, um, what kind of dress people are wearing at the time. Uh, most of these drawings are coming out of New England. So a lot of the people are wearing more of your Puritan clothes. So they're wearing a lot of black. Um, they are eating obviously things that are growing in that area. So a lot of cranberries, turkey, sweet potatoes, um, the kind of things that we all enjoy today. Before that Thanksgiving, people kind of just ate whatever was in their region, whatever was growing locally. Um, there wasn't a traditional Thanksgiving meal like we have today. That didn't really come about until it became more publicized in artwork and in writings of the era. And the last thing that goes along with Thanksgiving that started during the Victorian era, is most men during Thanksgiving have a tendency to watch football. Right? Some of our biggest college rivalries play on the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, that began in 1890 when Michigan and Chicago played in the very first Thanksgiving Day college football game. Um, this is the Michigan football team from 1891. Um, I look at that picture and think how in the world they, they play football looking like that and dressed like that. They probably got themselves beat up. Um, but Chicago and Michigan were one of the biggest rivalries of the time. Um, so that is where all of that sort of stems from. All right, so that is gonna take us into Christmas, of course. So the time frame that we're gonna cover is quite extensive. Um, Victorian era is one of the longest eras in history. It lasted from 1837 until 1901 and follows the reign of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Um, Prince Albert came from Germany, um, marries Victoria, um, and she reigns for a very long time. And just like, you know, a lot of times, most of our fashions, a lot of things that we're looking to do, we're taking our cues from England. Um, holiday traditions are no different. Anything that they did in England and that was happening in the palace with Queen Victoria and Albert was finding its way into mainstream America, sometimes a little behind um, and sometimes with a couple tweaks, but it was all coming from, from them. Um, during this era, Christmas became a time where people were looking to be united. Um, remember, it is, you know, the... You know, 1837, it's not long after there are several wars in Europe that are going on. Um, the United States is even dealing with some things in that regard. So people are looking for a sense of unity around the holiday. Um, and they're also longing for kind of that sense of old times, you know, the good old days when things always seemed happier and peaceful and calm and everybody got along. And one thing that goes on through this entire period is they are very much at a crossroads between nostalgia and staying very traditional and progress. Because also during this era, we hit the Industrial Revolution. So um, mass production you know, comes into play, transportation comes into play, um, and communication, right? People are able to get in touch with each other a little bit easier. They're able to travel from house to house easier than they had been in the past. So all of this coming together starts to form our holiday traditions. Um, one of the first ones to emerge is the Christmas tree. Um, being that Prince Albert is from Germany, they had begun the tradition of the Christmas tree. So he brought it with him to England. Um, the colored image that you see there is from the Illustrated London News. Um, and when that image hit the press, everybody wanted a Christmas tree. Everybody wanted to have the same thing that Queen, the Queen has in the palace. Um, the tradition early on was to decorate the tree with very simple things that everybody has around their house. So it was a lot of fruit, nuts, 
candy um, and homemade decorations. It was tradition for families to get together, particularly mothers and their children, um, to make ornaments. They would sit for months prior to the holiday using scraps of leftover fabric, buttons, you know, wood, anything that they had kind of lying around and produce their own Christmas ornaments. Originally, the trees would have been lit by candles. Um, of course, there's no electricity at the beginning of any of this, so we're not having strings of lights on. So they did use candles. Um, you could get a good idea of what that looked like in the other picture here. Um, a lot of people, when I say they lit trees with candles, they kind of go like their eyes pop out of their head. They think it's crazy because um, it's a fire hazard waiting to happen. Uh, but the candles are not what we typically think of. Um, the way that they would be put on the tree is they clipped on to the tree and they have a special holder. So the way that they're held, it comes up much higher on a taper candle. And as the candle melts, it kind of falls in on itself. So it's not really spreading. You're not going to have hot wax dripping all over the place. Um, and also, as you can see by these pictures, the trees that they had at the beginning of this time were not something that most of us would put in our house today. It, they are very sparse. Um, they were just going out into the woods, you know, and cutting down any small tree that they could find. Typically, they were fairly small as well. They would be up on tables um, because the common person didn't have a lot of space in their house. So it was easier to put a tree up on a table in the corner. And then you also had all the space on the floor around it. So you weren't losing a ton of living space in your house. Um, by the 1860s, they started producing glass balls. Um, they were very, very simple, just a solid glass ball, um, sometimes in a few different colors that they were able to produce, but very simple. Um, and they would be interspersed with those homemade ornaments. It wasn't until around 1870 that ornaments started to become more mass produced. They were able to make molds of figures um, and produce them at a fairly reasonable cost to the average person. So people started buying ornaments that you, know, you might find the same one on every tree in town. And the majority of those at the beginning, the first few that they were making like this, most of them consisted of angels and things that referenced childhood. So toys, um, you would see little wooden soldiers, um, rocking horses, dolls, things along those lines that would be that would be put on the tree. Again, kind of hearkening back to that feeling of nostalgia and happiness and you know the bright-eyed children on Christmas. Uh, it wasn't until a little bit later that electric lights start to come in and the candles fade um, from use and garland becomes huge. Everybody by the early 1900s is putting garland and tinsel all over their trees. Now, Anybody that puts garland and tinsel on their tree today is doing it because they like the way it looks. When people started doing it in the early 1900s, it had a purpose. Um, it was done to reflect the light from the lights on your tree. What they discovered was that when you put electric lights on your Christmas tree, they're not as bright as when you put the candles on your tree. So in order to illuminate your tree even more, they put tinsel and garland. It's all metallic and reflective. So the light would bounce off of it and illuminate that tree and the space around it even more than just the electric lights would. So it was um, became a pretty common practice to put those things on, on your tree. Um, the first tree to ever be in the White House was put in in 1889 by Benjamin Harrison. And in 1894, Grover Cleveland installed the first tree with electric lights. Um, this is Grover Cleveland's Christmas tree. 
Um, you could see there, there's tons of tinsel on there. Um, the stringed popcorn, it is mostly balls throughout that entire tree. Um, and again, they're still putting it up on a table, even in the White House. I mean, obviously this room that they're in has plenty of space. You could put a huge Christmas tree if you chose to. But it continued to be the style to put trees up on a table. Um, it wasn't until much, much later that people started to buy bigger and fuller trees and putting them on the floor in their house. Right. Um, the next thing that goes along with the holidays is Christmas stockings. Um, stockings come about through a very old tale um, where a man had three small daughters and they were in very poor financial standing. And one night they washed out their stockings, they hung them by the fireplace before going to bed. And the father sat up at night praying for their daughters to find suitable husbands and also that they would be able to provide a better life for their children. And in the morning when they woke up, St. Nick had come and he had filled their stockings. Um, and the main thing that was in there was a solid gold ball in each one. So that would provide them plenty of money. Um, and at this time, the more money somebody had, the easier it is to find a suitable husband. So they were going hand in hand. Um, this, this story, when it was first produced uh, and published, took off. Everybody started hanging stockings. Um, and in the stocking, it became a tradition to put an orange in the toe of your stocking. So you would receive an orange every Christmas morning because it is the color that it is. It was to represent that gold ball that the first Christmas stocking was filled with. Um, so people still today, um, stockings have kind of, you know, today they can just go along with everything else. Um, but they were known dur mostly during the Victorian era as being what people called a poor man's Christmas. Um, people that couldn't afford big fancy presents, they could still hang stockings and they would fill them with small little necessities. So they would mostly fill them with fruit, again, nuts, candy, maybe a little bit of money, um, things that people could utilize as opposed to toys or even clothes um, that were much more expensive to go out and purchase. One thing that came out during the Victorian era that really kind of took Christmas and made it what it is, is the publication of A Christmas Carol. So A Christmas Carol was written by Charles Dickens um, it was published in 1843, and it's the fourth of his Christmas stories, but it's the only one that became so widely known. But it was written after Dickens visited the Field Lane Ragged School that was a home to London street children. And he had it published right before Christmas. It came out on December 19th, 1843. And by Christmas Eve, it had sold out. You couldn't find a copy anywhere. Um, it is one of the few, book, few books, excuse me, that has never been out of print. And it shared all of those themes that people want to feel around the holidays. So it emphasized family, charity, goodwill, peace, and just general happiness. And when he talks about some of the traditions in the book and the drawings throughout the book, it popularizes Christmas. Everybody wants to have a holiday like the end of a Christmas Carol, right? When Tiny Tim, you know, the, his family receives their gifts, 
and he comes running out of the house with his father or is carried out of the house with his father, you know, and everybody has a Merry Christmas and even the worst person, Mr. Scrooge, can have a change of heart that time of year and become a better person. Everybody wants to feel that. Everybody wants to do what is in that book. So people are exchanging gifts. They're caroling. They're having big meals with family and friends. They're having parties um, just in order to be part of that feeling. So that book is credited with really popularizing Christmas as we know it. Um, so of course they're giving out gifts throughout this whole time period as well, but their gifts are changing too. So at the beginning of the Victorian era, um, people that didn't have as much means as others were mostly giving out very small homemade presents. Um, and you didn't give gifts to everybody, you know, um, they were only giving them say to their children, their parent, um, you know, very, very immediate family. And a lot of them were homemade with anything you had laying around the house. Um, like you can see here with these clothespin dolls, they take leftover clothespins or even broken clothespins, some leftover fabric and paint and some colors, and you have a small doll. Um, people with a little bit more skill would be making things out of wood, like you see there in the other picture. So wooden blocks, very small toys, um, like the wagon you see there, paddle balls, tops, things that you could just carve out um, with tools that most people had at the time. So very small, very simple gifts. Once industrialization takes off, toys and gifts completely shift because they are now able to mass produce items. So the cost of things becomes much less. So people are able to afford more uh, and the toys start to change. So games become more popular, um, dolls, books, and clockwork toys. Um, which is most of what you can see here. So things like a jack-in-the-box, a music box, um, anything where you crank a handle and something happens. It makes a sound, something jumps out, something moves. Um, all of that becomes extremely popular. And also at the time, the production of books becomes easier. So before industrialization, books were very, very expensive. Only the wealthy were able to amass a decent sized library because paper was expensive. Well, once in industrialization comes about, the price of paper goes down, it's much easier to produce the books. So people are purchasing books mostly for their children for the holidays as well. Some of them that were popular at the time or things like Mother Goose and Grimm's fairy tales. So of course, if you're going to have presents, you have to wrap them. Um, at the beginning of the Victorian era, wrapping paper was brown paper. Um, it was basically like wrapping a gift in butcher paper. And the decoration came from bows and ribbons. So people were tying up all of their presents, they were sticking decorations in it. So people go outside and, you know, trim a bush, they'd get a holly bush, or they'd put, you know, parts of flowers in, tuck them in with the bows. And that's how they were decorating their packages, not with some fancy wrapping paper. Um, it wasn't until a little bit later that decorative paper starts to come about, where they are able to mass produce and print paper with color on it and designs on it. The early designs were all related to nature. It was mostly flowers, trees, birds, um, things of that nature. Some winter animals, you might find rabbits and owls and things like that, um, but they were all very much outdoors 
images that you were finding on your paper. By 1863, tissue paper is invented. Now, most people don't wrap presents in tissue paper. Some people do, but most people use it as the filler, right? You tuck it in as pretty color in a gift bag. You put it in a box to kind of cover things up. But when it came out, it was the cheapest way to put colored paper on your gift. And it was just obviously solid color, uh, but you were able to wrap your presents in it. So when tissue paper came out, it became a means of wrapping your presents, not putting it inside necessarily. Um, it wasn't until a little bit later that they started really using wrapping paper as we know it today. It was more towards the early 1900s um, that mass produced wrapping paper would come about and kind of remain how we have it today. <clears throat> so one of the other books to come out during this time introduces a very familiar Christmas character to us. Uh, it is A Visit from St. Nicholas by Clement Seymour, otherwise known as The Night Before Christmas. This book was originally published on October 23rd, or sorry, December 23rd, 1823. So a little bit before the time period we're talking about, but it was not popular right away. Nobody was reading it. By the 1840s and 1850s, Night Before Christmas became one of the po most popular stories in the world about the Christmas season. Um, originally, Clement C. Moore didn't even claim authorship to the story. That's how unsuccessful it was. Um, later on, he did claim that he is the one to have written the book. But what this story did is it was the first time that the world was introduced to an idea of Santa Claus and that people could put a vision to him, right? So prior, if you were getting gifts on Christmas day, they were coming from your family. There wasn't some, you know, magical person coming and delivering whatever you wanted until this book is written. So people all of a sudden hear about Santa, they get a description of what he looks like, they also learn about his transportation and that he has reindeer and a magical sleigh. And it is the first time that we are introduced to this idea that Santa Claus brings toys to children. And from that point on, this idea of Santa Claus would kind of spiral and his story would get larger and larger over time thanks to Thomas Nast. So Thomas Nast um, is one of the greatest political cartoonists of all time. Um, and in 1863, he was working for Harper's Weekly and they asked him to draw a cover for Christmas. So this is what he drew. Um, now we're in the midst of the Civil War. So that's what he draws. He draws it from the Union perspective. So Santa is coming to deliver gifts to the troops and he comes to camp in his starred jacket and his striped pants. So it is probably the most patriotic Santa Claus you will ever find. Um, and he's bringing necessities to the soldiers. They're receiving things like hats and socks um, that they obviously would need. And the little, um, the drummer boy there at the front, he is receiving a jack in the box. So the kids are getting toys, the adults are getting what they might need. Um, and he still kept his political aspects into this particular drawing because it's very hard to tell, but in the background of the, the um, sketch, he has Jefferson Davis being hanged, um, kind of trying to predict what's going to happen during during the war. So he still puts that political spin on this particular cartoon. And as time goes on from year to year, he changes Santa Claus just enough 
and introduce different aspects of what we would come to know as Santa. So by 1873, 10 years later, he draws this colored image here. Um, this is Santa sneaking in down your chimney. So nobody ever knew how Santa got in the house. Right? He just sort of poof appeared in the house one day. Um, Thomas Nast introduces this idea that he's coming in down your chimney secretly. And a couple of years later, he draws this other one called Seeking Santa Claus with this idea of children, you know, sneaking around trying to catch a glimpse of what he might look like and what he's delivering to them on Christmas night. Um, this one happens to be on his roof, um, but I'm sure you've all heard stories or maybe even did it yourself or your children have done it, you know, trying to stay up as late as you can to just catch a glimpse of Santa coming into the house um, or hearing him, you know, downstairs by the tree delivering gifts. And then he draws this picture. Our next introduction to another piece of Santa's story. Um, this is called Santa Claus's Mail. So when he draws this, he introduces two things. One, the idea that Santa Claus has a naughty and a nice list and that you need to make sure you're on the nice list or you're not going to get anything. The other thing it introduces is this idea of writing letters, writing your Christmas list, writing Santa, telling him how good you have been throughout the year and you deserve, you know, the newest toy. Um, that didn't happen before. So he kind of puts that into mainstream America just by drawing a picture. Um, and one of the last ones that he drew was in 1881, where he draws Merry Old Santa Claus. And this image becomes the most well-known and accepted image of what Santa Claus looks like. So it is the epitome of the descriptions you hear in a lot of the old Christmas stories, right? A happy, jolly old man with his white beard and his rosy cheeks and his red nose delivering all the best toys um, and just this happy-go-lucky, jolly old fellow right? Um, with his bright red coat. It, so he puts what people have read about Santa Claus and kind of enhances it and puts a picture out there. So now everybody has the same vision of what this person looks like. Right? And it becomes the most popular thing in the world at the time. Um, in 1897, um, Another thing happens that kind of sends the world into a tizzy about Santa. When Virginia O'Hanlon writes a letter to the editor of the New York Sun asking if there is a Santa Claus. Um, she writes, she was eight years old at the time that she wrote it. And she says, dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? And the editor of the paper writes back. And what he writes is phenomenal. Um, and he doesn't write it directly to Virginia. He writes it to the world. And he gives people this not only yes, a Santa Claus exists, but he gives people this kind of magic feeling of believing in something maybe a little bit greater than themselves, um, believing in something that they can't necessarily see, but is around them and makes it more of a, a feeling and a belief in something. Um, so I'm gonna read to you what he wrote. So bear with me because I think people hear bits and pieces of his response but very rarely have people heard everything that he says. And it's fantastic um, at this time of year, especially. So in response to her, he says, Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. 
They do not believe except they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know what? And excuse me. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished not believe in Santa Claus, you might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus. But even if they did not see him coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not, but that's no proof that they're not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are unseen and unseeable in the world. You may tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world, which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, and romance can push aside that curtain and view and picture the su supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world, there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus. Thank God he lives and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia. No, 10 times 10,000 years from now. He will continue to make glad the hearts of childhood. Everybody talks about Virginia right in the letter. Nobody ever talks about the guy that wrote back. And his answer is fantastic to a world of people who are sad and miserable and questioning things and going through wars and depression and you know everything else that could possibly go wrong in the world at this given time. His answer gives everybody just a little bit of hope and makes them believe in something a little bit bigger. Okay, so phenomenal response, if you ask me. <coughs> All right, so that's gonna take us to our next Christmas thing, which is the Christmas card. Um, in 1843, a gentleman named Harry Cole, he was living in England and he commissioned artist John Calcutt Horsley to design a Christmas card for him. Now, up until this time, Christmas cards were all homemade. This was a time when people wrote very long, extensive letters. People weren't traveling. Right? It took a very long time to get to anyone. So you only really saw the people in your immediate community. So their way of communicating was obviously by writing letters. And Christmas was a time to write and fill everybody in on what was going on in your life throughout that year. And in order to make it more, kind of seem more Christmas, they would make cards. So children would draw pictures, you know, sometimes they would, you know, sew little things and put them in there. Um, but that was about it until Horsley designed the Christmas cards in 1843. Now, the initial run of these cards, they only printed a thousand. And it depicted people sitting around a dinner table um, of all economic backgrounds. There were very well-dressed people along with, you know, very poor people. 
um, all sharing a holiday meal. The problem with these cards is that they were very expensive. So in order to purchase a Christmas card at the time, it would have cost you one shilling in England. Today, it's eight cents in our world. Well, eight cents is not much. I'm sure if we could buy a Christmas card for eight cents, we'd all be very, very happy. But eight cents in 1843 was a lot of money and people just weren't able to afford them. So they printed a thousand and they weren't selling. It wasn't until around 1900 that the Christmas card really takes off because again, due to industrialization, they were able to have the price of cards drop and people are able to afford them in mass. So by 1900, um, or in 1900, I should say, they sold 11 and a half million Christmas cards in the United States. So very different than how it was 50 years before. Um, but the cards kind of took the same path as the wrapping paper. Everything started out being very focused on nature. So showing snow scenes, you know, obviously holly, tr evergreen trees, robins were very popular, um, birds to be depicted on these cards. A little bit later on, as time progressed, they start introducing other things. Um, so Santa Claus starts to get introduced onto cards, even though they still carry that nature theme, because as you can see by these examples, Santa is outside, right? Um, he's in the snow. He has holly and leaves throughout his wheelbarrow. They're marching through the snow, delivering presents. So they keep this natural theme going on throughout the whole thing. Um, eventually they start to even branch out a little bit more and start bringing in images of children at the holidays, um, like these two trying to drag their Christmas tree home um, with their presents. <coughs> and my personal favorite, it's the Zoom of the Victorian era. Santa Claus has all these children calling him and he can talk to them all at the exact same time. So. Um, also, during this time, we start to see more elaborate decorations. People start not just with their tree, but decorating the outside of their house, decorating their mantles, um, you know, stairwells, and things like that take off. People are putting more and more holiday decorations out, and family is the basis of everything. Um, what people were doing on Christmas, um, between Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and the days kind of surrounding it, they were filled with, originally, it was your immediate, immediate family. It's the people that live in your household, right? because transportation just wasn't available. Once mass transportation comes about, and people have the train, so they can now visit family and friends, then it becomes common for maybe you know, your family to come stay with you over the holidays. But the majority of the entertainment focused on the immediate family in your house. Um, it would have been filled with games. Um, one of the most popular games of the time was something called passing the boot. Um, basically what it was is somebody took off their shoe and you formed a giant circle children and adults alike formed a big circle with one person in the center. The person in the middle would close their eyes and the boot would get passed behind everybody else's back. When the music stopped, the person in the middle had to try and guess who was left holding the boot. If they figured it out, they would get some sort of little trinket or piece of candy or something. And then they could get back into the circle and participate in passing it around. Somebody else went in the middle. Um, and you would do that basically until everybody wins. Um, one of the other things was hide and seek became very popular. Um, there was one where there's another game from the time where you'd hide an object somewhere in the house um, and everybody would have to go on kind of a scavenger hunt trying to find that object. And the first one to find it got to keep it. 
Um, so it was a big, exciting, exciting time. Um, and it wasn't just for the kids. Like I said, it was an adult and children all participating in the same activities. Um, music was big. Almost every home had a piano in it um, with typically the mother being able to play, um, usually some of the children, um, and they would play your traditional Christmas songs and sing and kind of put on their own shows, plays, um, things like that, create their own skits and to entertain each other. Um, and one of the stories that comes out at this time that it became, it was very popular to sit around and read out loud. So on Christmas Eve night, Christmas day after everything kind of settled down, people would gather around the fireplace and typically the, the male of the house would sit with a book and read the story to everybody else in the house. One of the stories that became very popular in 1884 that none of us would imagine being a Christmas story is Robert Louis Stevenson's The Body Snatcher. It is not a Christmas story by any means, but it came out in December of 1884 and was published in the Paul Mall Christmas Extra. And so when it came out, it was the newest piece of literature so everybody started reading it. They sat around their fire reading this story on Christmas and it became a tradition. So it is known as a Christmas book um, because it became a tradition for people to sit around and read it on Christmas, oddly enough. Um, also associated with all of this stuff going on, obviously there is food um, and this is just a sample menu for Christmas dinner from the era. A um, little different than what I'm sure some of you have on your Christmas table. Some of it probably similar, um, but they would have had things like consomme, which is basically beef broth, um, olives, celery, pecans, and then you, know, you have goose and chicken, um, potatoes, applesauce, cream of lima beans, which just does not sound appetizing to me. Um, plum pudding, which also comes from, from England. Um, frozen pudding, which I'm not exactly sure what frozen pudding is, but and cakes, crackers, cheeses, things like that. And the one thing that is in there, this dressed lettuce with cheese straws is an interesting Thing, interesting food that hasn't quite made its way into mainstream America. Um, it is basically lettuce leaves with a little bit of dressing on them. Um, but, and these cheese straws are, the best way I could describe it is a very thin, if you were going to make a mozzarella stick, very thin, but you mix all the breading and seasoning in with the cheese and then bake it. So they come out kind of crispy. Um, so it's a crunchy mozzarella stick in mini form. That makes sense. So it's an interesting combination of things um, that, they, that they would be making for, for Christmas dinner. And here's just an image of what that those meals would have traditionally looked like. All right, so one of the last things is music. Um, a lot of Christmas carols become popularized during the Victorian era. Um, in 1833, right at the beginning of this time period, the first published book of Christmas carols comes out. It is called Christmas Carols Ancient and Modern and features the first Noel and Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Um, most of these early songs are very secular and they're songs that have been around, a lot of them, that are published at that time have been around for a long time um, through oral tradition and through religion, but they've never been written down and put out to the general public. So this is the first time that anybody that wants to sing these songs has a copy of it right in front of them and now knows every single word and every verse to them and also has the music. So it can, they could can be played at home as well. 
You don't have to memorize how to play something like the first Noel. You just pick up the book and play it. Um, some of the other things that come, other songs to come out um, between 1843 and 1851, so in the course of about eight years, we are introduced to God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, O Come All Ye Faithful, Once in Royal David City, Came Upon a Midnight Clear, and See Amid the Winter Snow. Again, all very secular um, songs. As the era kind of progresses by the mid 1850s into the 1860s, the songs become more fun. Um, because we are now introduced to concepts of things like Santa Claus, we can have songs that go along with it. So we are introduced to Jingle Bells, Deck the Halls, Up on the Housetop, and Jolly Old St. Nicholas. Um, and when all of these songs start to come about and people are able to purchase books of them and learn them very easily, one of the things that really takes off as well is caroling, um, going door to door, singing songs, playing music, being on the street corner or in the town square, um, performing for everyone else. These things are able to happen much more readily as well. Um, the last two um, were in 1865, A Little Town of Bethlehem is published. And in 1883, Away in the Manger comes out. So a lot of our more popular Christmas songs um, are introduced to, to us throughout the Victorian era as well. Um, and many of them, like I said, are, are secular songs, but plenty of them are not and kind of come about at the same time as things like our ideas of Santa Claus and stockings and the Christmas tree and things like that come, music comes right along with it to match. Um, so that is basically the Victorian era with the holidays in a nutshell. Um, so I'm sure now every time you do something Christmassy, you'll go, oh, I know where that comes from. Um, you won't think of it the same way anymore.